To jest podcast System Trader, odcinek 110. A dziś zapraszam do wywiadu z Nikiem Maziuli, autorem książki Just Keep Buying. Po prostu kupuj. Oto co proponuje Nick Maziuli, jeśli idzie o inwestowanie w książce pod tym właśnie tytułem. Jest to znakomita pozycja, ponieważ traktuje inwestowanie w bardzo prosty i praktyczny sposób. Nikt przy pomocy twardych danych obala mity ze świata finansów osobistych i inwestowania. Odpowiada na pytania, przedstawia rozwiązania i daje skuteczne sposoby na sukcesywną budowę majątku. Tym bardziej ucieszyło mnie, że choć sam przeczytałem tę książkę ponad rok temu w oryginale, tak teraz jest dostępne jej tłumaczenie na język polski. A żeby być bardziej precyzyjnym, nie tyle tłumaczenie co adaptacja, bo teraz książka uwzględnia perspektywę osoby z Polski. Cieszy również to, że za tę adaptację zabrał się Michał Szafrański z bloga Jak oszczędzać pieniądze, autor kultowej książki Finansowy Ninja. Widziałem efekt końcowy i z ręką na sercu mogę ją polecić absolutnie każdemu. Panie i panowie, zapraszam serdecznie na obszerną rozmowę z autorem książki Nikiem Maggiuli. Na koniec mam jeszcze komunikat. W dniach 24 i 25 listopada 2023 roku w Warszawie odbędzie się konferencja Forum Finansów i Inwestycji. Osobiście przelatuję tam z Brukseli i będę miał przyjemność zaprezentować Wam Atlas ETF, czyli portal ETF-ów, który rozwijam razem z Arturem Wiśniewskim. Ale mój występ to kropla w morzu materiałów edukacyjnych, jakie na Was czekają. Będzie tam wiele osób kojarzonych z branżą inwestycyjną, blogerów i przedstawicieli różnych instytucji. Zainteresowani? To zapraszam na stronę forumfinansów.pl A już teraz zapraszam do obiecanej rozmowy z Nikiem Maggiuli. Rozmowa nagrana jest w języku angielskim, ale na stronie systemtrader.pl ukośnik 110, tak jak numer tego odcinka, jest też tłumaczenie. A jeśli oglądacie tę rozmowę na YouTube, to można włączyć sobie napisy z opcją automatycznego tłumaczenia na język polski. Hi Nick, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? I'm not too bad, thank you very much. Thank you for accepting my invitation to the podcast. Um, I read your book, by the way, Just Keep Buying, which is the main topic of uh, our today's discussion. But before we will dive into details, could you please just introduce yourself and tell us a few words about yourself? Yeah, my name is Nick Majuli. I'm a chief operating officer at Ritholtz Wealth Management, which is a wealth management firm based in New York City. And I'm the author of, of dollarsanddata.com, which is a blog, and I obviously put out the book, Just Keep Buying. So that's kind of my background. And indeed, it's a wonderful read. Uh, what was your motivation to write a book uh, about investing? There's so many books out there. Uh, I think the, the main thing I wanted to do was do like a data-driven analysis of a lot of personal finance and investing beliefs. It's not just investing. That's really the second half of the book. But I wanted to say, hey, you know, what does the evidence actually say about a lot of these things? And so I go through a lot of different, I would say, beliefs that are out there, maybe even myths in some cases. And I say, like, hey, is this actually true or not? And so that's kind of the the whole gist of it. I think a lot of people, you know, don't have as, you know, I just happen to love data stuff. I have pretty good data skills. So I was like, let me apply that to investing. And I've been in personal finance. I've been doing that for almost seven years now. And at the time when I wrote the book, I've been writing for five years online. I said, you know what? I think now I have enough, you know, I've done enough work that I can put together a book and, and really put together something special. And this is really what I liked. The thing that, um, as you mentioned, you are a data-driven uh, person and you have the programming skills. You even included the Python code to your book. So this is really what I like because, uh, you know, everyone may have some opinions, but you are giving the proofs for whatever you say in your book. So this is really very, very appreciated. What do you think about your book in terms of um, what is the most important message? I mean, who is, uh, who is it addressed to? It's a, I mean, the best person that could read it would be someone who's like in their early 20s, you know, there's someone who's coming maybe out of college or, you know, just getting their first job. So the earlier I can get to you, the better, right? That's kind of like who, the ideal customer. I mean, anyone can, anyone can read it at any stage in their financial life, but it's going to have a lot more weight the earlier I can get to, right? So, and the main message is to like, just keep buying a um, diverse set of income producing assets, right? That's the whole idea. And so I, there's that diversification, there's the continual purchase, that's a behavioral thing, or you're buying over time, or you're just you're still buying no matter what the headlines say, right? So there's, there's a lot of little things built into there that I think can, can help investors kind of go through long periods of, t of time and still build wealth. And I think diversification um, and matters a lot too. And we can we'll get into that a little bit. And you'll see why but I just know as someone who's 
you know, it's, it, you know, being in the U.S. and the U.S. the U.S. has done quite well, especially since 09, you know, what, whereas Europe has not done as well. But this is why we stay diversified. So European investors should ideally own some U.S. stocks or right? have some U.S. stock exposure and vice versa. I own European stocks, even though they're down. I'm not selling out on them or anything because I think there will be a change where European stocks outperform U.S. stocks. When that happens, who knows? But I'm kind of just waiting for that. All right. I know that the book is already very successful, not only in the United States. Uh, how many languages has this book been translated into? Um, I think we have contracts for like 11 other languages outside of English. 11. But but I know it's been released in at least six or seven, right? Like Japanese, Korean, Chinese, which is Taiwan. Um, it's coming out in Polish soon, obviously. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Indonesian, um, Marathi, which is Indian, and then... I probably missed one or two, or German, yeah. So there's there's quite a bit. I think release right now is like seven or eight, but um, overall I would say there's probably like maybe 13 out there, and they're still kind of being released as, as time goes on. Your book is mostly very, I would say, uh, universal, but what do you think about the idea of not really just only translating uh, the book, but also kind of adapting the book, for example, uh, into Polish language? So, for example, if you have someone from Poland, um, the majority of your book is absolutely uh, uh, really uh, helpful for such person. But there are things like, for example, retirement plans. And do you think that then adapting the book rather than just purely only translating is helpful? Yeah, no, I think adaptation is essential um, for international audiences. And it's something if I could go back and like kind of rewrite the book, I wouldn't change that much about it, but I would make it slightly U.S. focused and I would add a little bit more international stuff because I didn't realize um, how much of an international audience I had. And maybe it's just because I'm so steeped in the U.S. and U.S. investing culture. Most of the people I interact with are in the U.S. I have no clue about like everyone else that's out there. And so I'm very like humbled by this like experience. Like, wow, I'm like just there's all these other people that read my stuff and I had no idea. Right. And so for me. If I could go back, I would have put even more focus on like international stocks, how, you know, as an international investor, how would you, you know, get exposure to U.S. stocks, for example, like just little things like that could be helpful. Um, and so I, so I think adaptation is absolutely necessary. And yeah, and so usually when I work with the um, international trans, uh, translators, I say, yeah, let's remove this stuff. Like there's a whole chapter in there. I think it's like chapter 19, which is on like the U.S. tax and retirement and all that. And that's obviously not relevant to anyone not in the U.S. So I, I'd be like, yeah, let's cut that out. And you guys put in like the relevant, in, in this case, we put in the the relevant chapter for for Poland. And so I think that's kind of what's necessary um, to kind of make it more relevant for that audience. And, it, and if not, if you don't have that, I say just cut that chapter out because it's not going to be as helpful if you're not a U.S. investor. Sure. Uh, you have already mentioned a, a bit about your portfolio that, for example, you have exposure to uh, the European uh, equities. But before we will dive into the details of savings and uh, investing, what you are, are covering in your book, uh, could we just talk a bit more about your portfolio, just skin in the game? I mean, what's your approach to saving and investing and how has it evolved over the years? So it hasn't evolved all that much. I mean, there's been things on the fringe have come in and out. For example, at one point I had a gold position, like, you know, I had five to 10% of my portfolio in gold. I now no longer own gold and that's, I haven't owned gold for like five years, but and I've been investing because I I've looked at the data for once I started really digging into the data, like gold can have like a 20 year real drawdown, like after inflation. And it's just like, I can't hold that position and look at it week after week for 20 years while it's still underwater. It's just too much for me. Of course, the U.S. stocks, in theory, have had periods like that, or stocks in general have had periods like that. But I think there's something that's there's like some fundamentals there, right? It's like there's like a business that's creating value, right? Versus gold is just a rock, right? So there's another. The only reason it's you know people the value the price goes up is because other people bid it up, right? Of course, that's true with stocks as well. But at least there's like some fundamental earnings or some fundamental thing that I can anchor to, right? And that gives me a little bit more like psychological relief or comfort when I know, hey, I actually own businesses that are actually doing things out there and trying to create value versus a gold rock. So that's an example of something I moved out of. It's been a um, small piece of my portfolio. I would say 90% of my portfolio has been in um, income producing assets. So that's mostly, you know, equities, whether that's uh, US, uh, international or emerging. And obviously emerging is just a subset of develop, you know, it's like international and then there's developed and emerging. So I would say that's split in two. Um, and so my equity portfolio has usually been of the equity piece, half U.S. stocks and half 
you know, international and that international has been half between emerging markets and um, developed, right? So in total, it's it's kind of trying to be market cap weighted in some way to the global market cap. I don't adjust it that often once a year. Um, and then I have a little bit in, in real estate investment trust, which is like a way of me getting real estate exposure without actually owning a house. And then um, bonds, you know, US, US treasury bonds, or in this case, they've usually been intermediate to short term. I think I've always been that way. I think I looked at the data a long time ago and, and long term bonds have almost never made sense to me because I don't know the just risk per unit return. Like you get the same level of return for way less risk in um, in intermediate to short term, or especially intermediate term uh, treasury bonds. So I, I never have owned long term. I've never owned anything like that. And obviously, we've seen last year bonds have been just destroyed when rates went up so much. And it's one of those things where like I was glad I was not in long term bonds. So yeah, especially but now. that's yeah, that's mostly the portfolio. So. I rebalance once a year. Um, I actually just ran the number since 2012 when I started investing. My portfolios returned like 4.5 percent after inflation, right? So that's kind of the rough real return. Um, you mean CAGR? Yeah, yeah, the that's the yeah compound annual growth rate, right? And so obviously, I'm not looking at the money weighted flows. I'm just saying, like, if you could just put one dollar in my portfolio, sure. but now compared to the S and P. The S and P has done something like you know eight or nine percent, right? So it's about four, and and that's just like because the S and P has been the best performing asset class on the planet, right? Obviously, when you look at my portfolio and compare it to all the individual asset classes, like my port, like the S and P is at the top because it's been the best, and then it's like my portfolio, and then it's like the rest of the asset classes in my portfolio, right? Because like emerging hasn't done as well, you know, it, developed markets haven't done as well. Uh, real estate investment trusts got rocked because of COVID, and now people aren't coming back to the office, right? Like bonds got rocked. So, like of the five assets, you know, it's kind of funny to think like my portfolio is like right in the center of all this, this stuff that's gone on, and and really it's been unfortunate that most of the asset classes in my portfolio have underperformed, but. That's just kind of the nature of you're always actually going to have assets that are underperformed by definition. If you have a diversified portfolio, by definition, you're going to some piece of your portfolio is going to be underperforming. You're going to be underperforming the top asset class at all times. So you have to accept that and be like, hey, that's OK. But look, I'm always getting that middle result. And even comparing it to something like a permanent portfolio or like the all weather portfolio from Ray Dalio, like my portfolio has outperformed both of those just because I have a little bit more as as S&P exposure and less exposure to things like commodities and 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 bonds, which which have kind of pulled down the return. And how do you implement your portfolio? Is it through ETFs or maybe index funds? Uh, for example, in Europe, mostly people are using ETFs. The index funds, at least in Poland, are not that popular because we don't have so many of them. But I know that in the United States, uh, it looks maybe a bit different because the index funds are there from the 70s already. So, so the tradition of having index funds is, is much longer than in Poland or in Europe in general. Yeah, I use mostly ETFs. Um, I, there's pluses and minuses to using ETFs over index funds. I think they're mostly equivalent. The only time you can get into trouble with an ETF is if you have some sort of stop loss and there's like there have been weird trading errors where like you, you see an ETF and it just all of a sudden it like drops like 20 percent in like a minute and then it shoots back up. Right. And if you have a stop loss, you'll sell that ETF and then it'll go back up and you literally just lost money for nothing. Right. So it's one of these things where you got to be careful with stop losses, whereas like an index fund like mutual fund does end of day pricing. So you never have like that intraday move. So there's just little things, and I've only picked this up from talking to people that have made these mistakes, and I don't have stop losses on my portfolio or anything like that. So um, I'm, I'm fully exposed to whatever market moves happen. So that's just one thing to keep in, uh, keep in mind. But yeah, I would say just ETFs are fine. Just be careful not to do anything kind of crazy because the intraday anything can happen, right? They're, remember, they're a basket. They're not actually owning the, the underlying stocks. They're like a basket that trades based on the underlying stocks. And it's you know how that's even done is just very interesting. Yeah. And by the way, the main concern of uh, John Bogle uh, against to have or to create the ETF was that he was uh, just afraid that people will start speculating rather than investing. Um, just what you said, I mean, people see in real time uh, what is the price over there. So there it's a huge temptation to start speculation. Um, my another question is, how much time do you spend to manage your portfolio? Because if I understand correctly, this is mostly uh, we could call it maybe passive portfolio, buy and hold portfolio. Yeah, I rebalance once a year. So that's me like, actually, no, I would say technically I'm, I'm not, 
my my official re if things get really out of whack i rebalance once a year but technically throughout the year i'm basically taking money and putting it in like quarterly so every quarter i'm just adding so there's i talk about this and just keep buying there's this idea called an accumulation rebalance now what that means is traditionally when you rebalance something let's say you have a 50 50 stock bond portfolio right if your stocks go up a lot, so stocks are 60 and bonds are 40, to get back to 50-50, you sell the 10% of stocks and you buy the 10% of bonds, right? That's You can do that, but that can cause tax consequences, right? Every time you sell something, there could, at least in the U.S., there could be a tax consequence, right? So I my method, which I think makes more sense, is like as you get new money, instead of you know selling the stocks and buying the bonds, just put all your new money to the bonds and you kind of slowly, by, by definition, rebalance through accumulation, through buying more. Now, you can't do that, do that forever. When you're young, you don't have as much money. It's much easier. As you get older and, and the portfolio values get bigger, unless you have a really high income, it's really hard to kind of move back in line um, just with, with standard flows, right, income flows. So that's something to consider. Like So throughout the year, I'm technically accumulation rebalancing in one direction or another. But if, if things ever get really out of whack, I do it once a year. So how much time am I spending? Like less than an hour a week, not even that. Like let, most weeks I spend less than 10 minutes. Just I might check, like, see how, how the market's looking and stuff. But, you know, and then, uh, you know, there's a few weeks a year where I'm like really looking and I have to, okay, I need to buy this or buy that or whatever it is. So I would say I don't spend that much time on it, honestly. And how about active approach? Have you been thinking about maybe applying some active strategies to your portfolio? For example, I don't know, trend following or maybe value investing or, or anything else. Uh, just maybe with the temptation that you will have a better uh, return? Yeah, so I have some very small tilts. So like, for example, within if if I have like, let's say, 80% of my portfolio is in equities and REITs, right? Let's just call that equities, even though REITs are not, let's just say equities. Of that, you know, roughly half of that 40% is, is S&P 500, right? Or is the US stocks? Within that 40%, that's US stocks. Not all of that's S&P, maybe like 35% of that is S&P or something. And 5% is like small or small value tilts I have. And I mean, that's what my, my firm does a little bit of that as well. So try, I we invest like based on that. So um, we do have a little bit of a trend following strategy. My I'm not in the trend following strategy. I probably should be though, because um, it actually is like, you know, it does well. So um, I think it's fine to do those things, but don't do that with like all of your money. You know, even we have like, you know, limits like, hey, the, if I know the trend following strategy has been performing well, but we don't like really allow people to put 100 percent of their money in that. You know, we say like this is a, a strategy that has a, a portion of your money. Um, so I have nothing against those things. I just think it, it's very easy to go from, hey, I'm just going to play this a little bit to all of a sudden you're like, hey, all my money's in this very risky strategy. And the reason why these things tend to outperform and or they can outperform is that there's long periods where they don't like value has been getting killed for the last decade, right? Um, against growth. So and and trend is done, I think it's slightly beaten the market over the last few years, but before COVID, it wasn't doing as well. And then since COVID, I think it's done a little bit better. So it's one of these things and even how you implement trend, it's very crazy to say, Oh, yeah, trends is beating the S&P 500. Because there's so many ways to implement trend where there's certain people that didn't get out during, you know, March 2020, or got out uh, too late and then bought back in even later. And so they, they, they kind of, they ate the, the decline in March, 2020, they saw that decline and then they bought back in much higher. And so it's one of these things where even how you implement a strategy can have massive impacts on its performance, especially during times like 2020, where there was really a lot of uh, crazy markets. Okay, so let's move slowly into the details of your book. And before investing, we of course, we have to save some money. And this is a problem for uh, many people. Um, I know not only in, in Poland, in Europe, but uh, in the whole world, basically. Uh, but you have a uh, good words in your in your book, because there's a statement that um, which is uh, quite surprising um, at the beginning, because you said that basically, we don't have to, or maybe let's put it the other way around, we need to save less than we think. So could you please explain why? Why is that? So I was using uh, data within the United States to make this argument. So I have no idea whether this is as relevant in Poland. So that's the first caveat of this discussion. But when I was looking at some of like the retiree data and like how, you know, how much people leave, how much money people leave behind, like when they pass away, like inheritances. And generally, you know, the older someone is when they die, the more money they leave behind, like on average. And of course, there's, you know, there's a, some things are being skewed by that. But 
just in general, you look and, and most retirees tend to keep accumulating wealth even after they retire. Of course, there's a, a small percentage of retirees that don't have much wealth and they're just living in the United States, living off Social Security, a government income, basically. But for most retirees that at least have portfolios, like they're not spending down their portfolios, they're generally seeing their wealth go up and then they pass and then all that money gets passed on after. So that's just what I saw. And so I'm like, hey, I'm looking at this and there's so many people that are like, so worried about running out of money. And I think the opposite is going to be a bigger problem or has been a bigger problem for retirees in the United States, at least, where they're not spending enough money. And so I think there's a book out there called Die With Zero. I'm not sure if it's in Polish or not. If it's been, yes, I'm assuming it's been it has been. Yeah. yeah, perfect. So like that, that book, um, not everyone's going to agree with that book. I think the message is a little extreme, but I think the message is more directionally accurate than the opposite, right? And so I think dying closer to zero is a better way of trying to do, you know, your retirement planning than what we currently do, which most people in the US basically never spend any of their portfolio. Like they never pull the principal, they just live off the income, right? So if you have a million dollar portfolio, and let's say it's earning you 4% a year, right? So you're getting 40 grand a year. Um, they just live off that if it's if, let's say it was invested in like short term treasuries and was making 4% a year, like it, they would just live off the $40,000. And when they would never touch the principal, right? And so that's one of those things where it's like, you probably could touch the principal and you'd be fine. You could spend more, give more to other people or help people or donate whatever you want. But a lot of people aren't doing that. And so that's the thing that's that's still kind of, I would say, I wouldn't say it's shocking anymore because I've seen it so much, but it, it was surprising when I first learned about it. Um, in your book, you are explaining also the 4% rule, which basically for those who doesn't understand or don't know this rule is that um, if you want to retire, if 4% of your capital is enough to uh, go through the first year and then adjust it for the inflation, then you are basically, um, we could even maybe say, uh, financially free. Uh, but recently there are, there are some papers saying that the 4% rule was uh, too optimistic because it was taking a very good period for the U U.S. stocks and maybe it will not hold up in the future. On the other hand, you put now the argument that in fact, um, uh, the spending decline in retirement as we are getting older, uh, do you think that then we could adjust the 4% rule and be more optimistic that maybe it's still uh, valid just because our spending will just decline over the years? I mean, yeah, there is there is some data, as you said, that spending tends to decline for retirees. It declines by about 1% a year. And what's causing that? It's like people aren't necessarily buying new cars or not buying new clothes, right? Once you get to a certain age, you're not like changing your wardrobe every year, right? So there's a lot of these little things that kind of add up and, and help retirees spend less. Um, in terms of whether the 4% rule will work going forward, I mean, everyone says it keeps saying, oh, it's dead, it's this, that, but like, and then look, where bond yields are now 5%, you can earn 5% a year, like you, the 4% the rule will work every, I mean, as long if bond yields stay like this, like 4% rule is going to keep working, assuming, I mean, inflation has to be below that, obviously, right? So if inflation is 4%, yields are 5%, you can still like do the 4% rule, right? So um, it's one of these things where, you know, I have no idea what's going to happen. I just think like 4% was pretty conservative. It was on a 50, 50 stock bond portfolio. It was done. They've done every single like, you know, back test on this. And I, I think it will still work. Of course, anything can happen, right? If we go into a world war or something in capital, most of the capital stock of the world's destroyed. Like there's all these crazy scenarios where this won't be true, but in any normal sense of the world and whatever normalcy means, you know, I think a long-term diversified portfolio, even including international stocks, would have produced the returns you need. And I've, I've done some analyses on this, like using an 80-20, where the 80 is actually using like a global stock and then 20 is just U.S. bonds. And, you know, you would have been able to build wealth like in basically every period, right? The question is how much and to what extent that's debatable, but that's the kind of stuff that, um, you know, I, I really believe in that over the long term. In your book, there's plenty of, I would say, uh, maybe not provocative, but a bit surprising statements. For example, one of them is uh, that saving is for the poor and investing is for the rich. Could you please explain us a bit uh, what is behind? How is that? Why um, you would say to someone who doesn't have enough cap capital uh, to, to, to not invest, but just uh, focus on saving? Yeah, so I, I wouldn't tell them not to invest. I think it's a little strong, but I would say that that shouldn't be their primary focus. So, you know, I think what we get into is there's people out there, especially like I put myself in like my what I was how I was thinking when I was 23. 
I was like super focused on my investments. I spent way more time looking at my portfolio then when I didn't really have that much money invested than now when I have far more. And so what's interesting is like I spent all this time trying to like, oh, should I do 15% bonds or 20% bonds? Should I um, own, you know, US or and like, so I'm, I'm always like in my head about what I, what my allocation should be. And the fact of the matter is like, let's say, and I use this example because it'll make a lot more sense. Let's say at a thousand dollars, a 10% returns a hundred bucks, right? That's a decent return in a year. 10% is not like a small return. I wouldn't say it's a super large return, but it's a decent return, right? In a given year. So a 10% on a thousand bucks is a hundred dollars. I was regularly going out with friends when I was 23, going to dinner, going out, going to a bar, doing shots, you know, getting an Uber home. Like you add all that up. I was spending my entire investment return in one night, a hundred bucks would be spent like that. And so I'm sitting here spending all this time analyzing my portfolio and like what I should do with my portfolio. At the same time, I'm out here spending all this money. Now, I'm not saying that I'm not regretting spending that money. I'm just saying, you know, what would have made a bigger difference. I could have just not gone out one night and I would have made equal to my investment return for a year, right? Like I could have foregone one night of going out of all the nights I went out in my twenties and I would have basically, you know, equated my investment return. So that's my point is like, when you don't have a lot of money, what really matters is how you're saving. It's how you the, how you save money. That's far more important than exactly how your portfolio is invested. So I'm not saying don't invest your portfolio. I'm not saying who cares how you invest your portfolio. I'm just saying like don't obsess over it. It's not it's not that important yet. It will be because once the numbers get bigger, once you have a hundred thousand dollars, now a ten percent returns ten grand. Now that's a little bit more serious money, right? Once you have a million dollars, a ten percent returns a hundred thousand, right? So you, you can see as the numbers get bigger, you, your focus on investing has to be more and more. So generally, what happens for most people, like who you know start start working with, they don't have much money, right? They start with very little, so they should focus mostly on their savings and their their spending behavior. And as they kind of grow their wealth, their focus starts to shift to their, where they're focusing on both. They have to think about their savings and they think about their investment behavior. But by the time they're nearing retirement, the only thing that really is going to make a going to move the needle, going to really matter is going to be your investments and how they do. And so tax efficiency matters, how you're allocated. Yeah, when you're 65 and you have a $2 million portfolio, how you allocate that $2 million is incredibly important. When you have a $2,000 portfolio, it's not that important, right? So that's the key understanding and the key insight. And so it's not that... You know, savings for the poor and investing for the rich. That I mean, when I say poor, I mean relatively poor. I was not a poor person, you know, at 23 years old living in San Francisco, you know, but I was relatively poor compared to my future self, right? In, in expectation, right, of what you know, working my career, saving money, etc. Most of us are. Most people are generally, except those that hit get bad luck or something. Most people are poorer now than they will be in the future, right? Assuming they're saving money and everything, right? I mean, working people, obviously, for retirees, that's different. They don't really work anymore. But excluding retirees, like, most people will should have more income and wealth and things like that in the future. So that's the main the main takeaway there. It makes complete sense. Um, another interesting statement in your book uh, is that even when we get richer, we still feel like we don't have enough money, which sounds counterintuitive because um, to many of us, especially if we don't have enough money, we think that, or at least we can imagine ourselves in the future does, that once we will have enough money, then we will be, um, we will feel much richer and maybe even uh, we will just be a better person. But in fact, it's not uh, that obvious. Could you please uh, explain? Yeah, so I think I was looking at, um, there was an interview by uh, Lloyd Blankfein, who was the uh, Ex CEO of Goldman Sachs, and this person's a billionaire. He's done very well in his career. He's obviously very successful. He's a billionaire, right? Um, and in the interview, they asked him if he was wealthy or you know rich, or and he said, oh, "I'm not that. I'm just like well to do." He, he's a billionaire. He's richer than ninety nine point nine nine. You know, I don't know how many nines percent of people on on Earth. And he's like, "Oh, I'm not. I'm not really that rich. I'm just like well to do. Like I'm like he's like kind of." And, and I started to say, like, well, why would he say this? Like, he's not a stupid person. There's no way he would he really believes he doesn't have wealth. I think it's because, like, most of his friends are far richer than him. Like, he hangs out with people like David Geffen, Jeff Bezos, right? So when, you're, when your friend group has, you know, 10x, 50x, 100x your wealth, you don't feel like the rich guy at the party, right? And so... I can understand that psych being in that psychological place, even if like he walks down, he walks into most places in the U S and he's the richest person there. Right. But when he's hanging out with his friends who are all very successful people in their own, right. He ends up not feeling as rich. And so 
I think there's a, that's what tends to happen to people. And that's not true for everyone, but you start to succeed, you start to do well. Maybe you start joining uh, different organizations or you start hanging out with different people. You're hanging out with other successful people. And guess what? You find that, wow, they're even richer than I am. And then even if you pass them one day, you go into another group of people and they're even richer. And so it, it never ends until you're like literally the richest person on earth. There's always going to be someone else you can point to be like, oh, I'm not rich. That person's rich. Um, and there was a there's a RI owner uh, named uh, uh, Fisher here in the United States, and he he was being uh, he was being interviewed, and uh, when he was being interviewed, he said, "Oh, I'm not I'm not rich. I'm average. I'm only in the I'm in the middle of the Forbes 400, right? Which is like it's a joke, obviously, but like you see the point. Like he was the Forbes 200 in the 400, even though he's obviously a multi billionaire, right? And so uh, Ken Fisher is an interesting joke he made, but it was one of these things where like that's kind of get it gets at the point. Obviously, his is like an extreme joke, but like I think people really have to tell themselves these tricks to like make themselves feel like they're not like incredibly wealthy. And I think because when you do stuff like that, it makes you think, oh, well, I'm not even that wealthy. So like maybe I don't need to donate as much. Maybe I don't need to do this. And so I think I don't know why people do this, but they do it one way or another. And and I I can't change the behavior. I just notice the behavior. And so you'll probably see the same thing with yourself. Right. And so like I, I'm even going to be writing a post on this. I kind of re retouching on this point again um, pretty soon because like the more successful you get, you just end up going into more competitive circles. And like you just find like you think like you're an exceptional in this particular thing. Like I would say I'm like at the 99th percentile of work ethic. But now once I've been on Twitter and seen other people have their own businesses and everything, it's like I know people that are like even further out on that tail who are like the 99.9th or the 99.99th, right? So it's like people who are just truly like um, workaholics. Like I think I'm a workaholic and I meet people. I'm like, how the heck do you work that much? You know, and that's that's what happens. Like when I was in high school, I, I didn't know anyone that worked more more harder than me. But now I know so many people that work harder than me. And so I think it's just being exposed to different circles of people and you realize like the world's a lot bigger and has a lot more competition than you think. And that's that's also true with wealth. Yeah. And by the way, there's always someone with a bigger house or bigger yacht. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> so it's like an endless game. Uh, but do you think there's uh, some correlation uh, between money and happiness that uh, at least to some point, the more you have, I mean, the more you have uh, money in your pocket, uh, the more happier person you may be? So it's very interesting. I've, I've looked at the date on this and wrote a post on it, which and this was not in the book or anything. And I, I probably would have put it in there now that I've kind of really dug into the data. Um, but basically, the original finding was like, hey, once you make over, I think it was like $70,000 a year in US dollars, like your your happiness doesn't necessarily go up. And research has come out since then that found that actually that's not true. Generally, if you're happy already, and you make more money, you will be happier. But if you're unhappy, more money's not going to make you happier. And those are very different statements, right? The, the first statement says, hey, if you're a happy person, you're enjoying your life. If I gave you more money, you would be happier, right? It's just like you're because you can do more stuff. You have more options. But if you're unhappy and you can be unhappy for a host of reasons, maybe you have a bad family life, maybe you hate your job, whatever. Pick one of the many reasons why a human can be unhappy. If you're unhappy, um, unless that unhappiness is literally linked to money, like I just don't have enough money then more money is not going to make you happier, right? So I think that's what the data shows. And so, yes, there's, there's a lot of people that just like, oh, my gosh, if I just had more money and I didn't have to stress about this, I would be happier. But after that, like, then the difference is like, are you actually happy outside of money? Because if you're not happy outside of money, you're not going to be happier with more money. And so I think that's the, the real takeaway here. It's not that more money can give you happiness. It's If you're already happy, more money gives you happiness, which is kind of a funny, it's like a weird, like, it's like ironic that like, oh, hey, this person's already happy and then more money would actually make them happier. That's what the data shows, at least. Um, but, you know, if you're unhappy, more money is not going to make you. Happy. And that's why you you hear these stories of like these depressed billionaires or depressed multimillionaires. It's like you have more money than most people like could ever dream of. There's so many people would, would trade places with you. But if there's other things in your life that aren't great, you're not going to feel great about that. So it's just something to think about in terms of the bigger picture of not just your finances, but your life. And what do you think about the fire movement? I mean, the, the financial independence retire early because it's becoming quite popular in Europe. In Poland, I see uh, quite a lot of people, young people, just uh, in the 20s, 30s, and they are really very, you know, uh, they have the specific goal to become financially dependent in 10, 15, 20 years. What's your take on that? 
So I have no problem with the financial independence part, the FI of FIRE, but I think the retire early can have some downsides that people don't necessarily think all the way through. And I'm, this is not true of everyone. So I remember this is, I'm kind of making a generalization here, but what I've at least seen talking to people about this, doing some research on it is, you know, retiring early is great if you know exactly what you're going to do in retirement. But I think there's a lot of people that just focus solely on this number. Once I hit X dollars, I'll be financially free and I can retire. Then they retire and then they get depressed because they don't know what to do with their life. It's like, you're still a human. You still want to feel like you belong to something bigger than yourself. You have, ex you know, your existence matters and you're not just like, I accumulate all these assets for what? And I've, I've, uh, talk with people online somewhere anonymous and told me like, Hey, like I travel like every six months I change my location, but like I have no family. I have no sense of belonging. I'm just like, just dr going to bars, drinking, partying, doing all this until I die. Basically these people are like in their fifties and they just never had a family or anything, but they, they did well financially. And so it, it's sad to hear those types of things. Those people do have the freedom to do whatever they want, but unfortunately they never found that thing that kind of gives them more than just the monetary reward. So you hear about, and I'm not saying that's everyone. There's a lot of people who retired early that are very happy and kind of enjoying their life and doing, knowing exactly what they want to do. So I would say, Hey, if you're going to go down this path, like there's nothing wrong with financial independence, but like, think about like, what do you actually want to do? And I think it's more important to maybe not have financial independence as early but you do something you love because then you can do it for longer and you'll enjoy your life more. I mean, that's ultimately, that's the point, right? At least in some, in some ways to have some enjoyment in life. And so I think people overly focus on, you know, financial independence because it's easy. It's measurable. It's easy to measure your wealth, right? Relatively easy. Once, I, I, once you get too rich, it can be tough because, you know, asset values change all the time. But for most people, it's relatively easy to measure your wealth. It's much harder to measure your satisfaction with your purpose or something else. So because it's a number and it's quantifiable, people chase it and it makes it really easy to kind of go after that path because it's, it's, there's a number there, right? It's hard to say, hey, guess what? My relationship net worth is, is at a nine out of 10, right? It's like people aren't thinking that way. They're just saying, hey, my financial net worth is X and that's more than these other people. And so I'm happy or something. And so I think there's, I think there's a lot more to it. But that's kind of, that's how my, I view this thing. It's just, you know, if you're going to know what you want to retire from, you got to figure out what you want to retire to. And that's the key por portion here. Yeah. To me also, I mean, living with a nose in, in the Excel spreadsheet doesn't sound like a happy <laughs> life. Um, so let's move on slowly to investing. Um, and quite often I see uh, reactions uh, from the people that uh, investing it's it's linked to something very risky so they don't want to invest because uh, it, it sounds like something very risky they don't want to speculate they put equal sign between investing and speculation uh, why should we invest and uh, what should we invest in because uh, the uh, big part of, of your book is dedicated to that topic yeah so why should you invest at least it's different in Europe because, you know, many European countries have a much better social safety net. What I mean by that is that in the United States, we have social security. So once you hit, you know, technically 62, but I think it's like 65 and 67 is now the normal retirement age. Once you hit a certain age, you can start taking money from the government. Um, I don't know the, you know, the specifics of every European country, but I know just like there's a lot better medical care. There's a lot better, you know, government aid and all those types of things for old people, uh, old, older people. And so because of that, there isn't as much of a demand to save money and invest for retirement. But for those who think, hey, like even with all these government aid, I don't think I'm gonna have enough or they think programs are gonna be cut, then that's the reason to save and invest because you wanna say, hey, I wanna be able to take care of myself and my family um, in old age. And so that's that's the biggest thing I would say is like think, taking care of your future self, right? Because at one point, at one day, I'm gonna assume you're not gonna want to work, you're not gonna be able to work anymore. And on that day is when you wanna say, hey, okay, I have the financial assets, which can basically keep working for me. And so what that means is maybe you buy a, you, you buy a government bond and you lend that money to the government and they pay you money. That's, ba that's as if your money is working for you. It's as you kind of rebuild yourself as what I call a financial asset equivalent. It's as if you are a financial asset. And, and you do that by just saving over time, investing that money and hoping that it grows and then that money keeps paying you over time. So that's kind of the why you should invest. Obviously inflation as well, if inflation if prices keep going up over time, if you're not investing, your dollars just, or you know, 
your currency euro etc is just kind of going down over time um so the the one that's why another reason to invest because of inflation right inflation's a reality whether it's right or wrong we can debate that but it's it's the world we live in and so given the world we live in you know people say oh there should be no inflation all this and all that it's okay that's a nice you know fantasy we have but that's not the world we live in until we stop you know um until we stop inflation and we want a world of zero inflation which people can debate why we would want that or not um we're gonna have it and so as we, given we have it we need to invest so that's another piece so think about your future self um investing that's another piece of it um and yeah because your capital your human capital is going to degrade over time so those are the main reasons why you should invest what should you invest in as i said a diverse set of income producing assets the mantra and just keep buying is the continual purchase of a diverse set of income producing assets so the diverse part you want to have diversification because no one knows what's going to happen world's uncertain you know even though the us is on top now go back to look at 2000 to 2009 it's a very different story the us was the worst performing market amongst most of the you know international stocks everything right and especially emerg emerging markets did very well from 2000 2009 us stocks not so well it's been the opposite since then so i don't know what the future holds but it's one of these things where you know i i can't guarantee the us is going to outperform you know international stocks so be diverse own income producing assets i can't tell you which assets to own in which proportions cuz things change over time right if you had asked me 5 years ago I would have said, yeah, you don't really want to own that much bonds. Like I only had a little bit in bonds because it was like a hedge against, you know, stock crashes. Now with with at least with US Treasury bills paying 5%, I mean, you're getting 5% of the 10 year was just at 5%. Like that's a different trade-off. Now it's like it's really hard not to own some bonds, right? So I think that's the thing. It's like as as the information changes, your allocation may change a little bit too or just at least the new decisions you make. I'm not saying you have to make crazy decisions like oh sell all your stocks only buy bonds i'm not saying to do that but going from a okay i'll have 10% bonds or 20% bonds and you know what maybe i'll hold 40% bonds that's very reasonable given the change in rates right so i think that's something to keep in mind is like the portfolio that's going to work or that could work for you going forward will change over time and there's nothing wrong with that there's a lot of people that say things like set it and forget it and i don't necessarily agree with that i think that's good for the short term but if if the information changes a lot you have to think about how you change your portfolio so you allow that uh, as we go through our life that we will have to adapt portfolio at some point to our current situation right um mm -hmm. at the same time in your book you don't recommend uh to buy uh, buying individual stocks. Uh, could you please explain why you're against buying individual stocks and do you prefer just to buy the whole market? Yeah, I'm always buying index funds. So that's like a diverse broad basket of the entire market within a given asset class. So for example, US stocks, that's going to be S&P 500, or you could just own you know, the Russell 3000, which is a more comprehensive index. But either way, there's a lot of different things you can own. And these will all like work in different ways. Um, the reason why I don't, I mean, there's two arguments put forth why you shouldn't own individual stocks. The first is what I call the performance argument. You've probably, some of your listeners have probably heard this one before, which is basically like, hey, like stock pickers, most stock pickers don't outperform the market. If you pick a random basket of stocks, they're probably not going to outperform the market because there's only a very small percentage of stocks that do very well and they basically carry the market. So because of that, Instead of trying to pick the needle in the haystack, you own the whole haystack is what's been said probably by, I think it was John Bogle said that. That's kind of the the idea there. Um, that's the performance argument. It's a good argument. There's nothing wrong with it. It's been heard before. I The argument I like to push is more of this like existential argument. Now, what do I mean by that is like, how do you know if you're a good stock picker, right? It's one of these things where because there's so much luck involved in in picking stocks, like the time between when you make a decision and when you see the payoff can be very large and you don't even know if if your decision was the reason that you got that payoff right whether it's a positive or negative payoff right it's like if me and uh you know um uh lebron james actually no let me let me move it to soccer let me if me and uh lionel messi went on a soccer field and played soccer against each other one-on-one -on -one, within if let's say no one knew who lionel messi was like he was just unknown but he had his talent still if him and i went to a soccer field you would know within two minutes that i didn't have skill and he did right there would be no debate that he knows what he's doing i don't it would be very obvious that he's skilled right but let's say me and lionel messi went to pick stocks I, i'm not 
am I a better stock picker than him? I have no clue. He might be better. He might by random chance, he might be better than me at this. And I don't know. And that's the thing. It's like, because of that, he might have a better performance and I might still even, so let me take the opposite. I might actually be better than him, but he might outperform me just from random chance. He might just buy a stock that happens to go up a ton, right? So that's the issue because there's so much luck involved with stock picking. You're never going to really know if you're good until you've done it for a really long time. And even then, if you're good in one period, it doesn't mean you're going to be good in the next. And there's just so many reasons why it's it's not something I recommend people do. Now, of course, someone wants to like, hey, I want to take 5% of my portfolio and put it into individual stocks. Go ahead. Have fun. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not against that at all. But I think when people put 100% of their portfolio into individual stocks, I think it's really tough because most people don't beat the market. And so you're going to sit there, spend all this time trying to beat the market with this and you may still underperform and and the time cost too like if every hour you spent studying stocks you spent doing anything else productive i bet you make more in just like your wage income you make more money just from doing something else than you would make off of the off the portfolio you know even a hundred thousand dollar portfolio let's say you make a i don't know i'm gonna give you a, a five percent alpha you beat the market by five percent right so let's say the market goes up by ten percent in a year that you would on a hundred thousand dollar portfolio that's ten thousand dollars right 5% alpha means you got an extra 5%. So instead of 10,000, you go up $15,000, right? So you made five grand. If you spend 10 hours a week doing that to make five grand, you do the math on that 10, let's say times 50, that's 500 hours, five grand. Like you're not making all that. You're making like 10 bucks an hour, right? If you spent 500 hours to make five grand, you're making $10 an hour. Now for some people, they're like, hey, I'll take $10 an hour. But for in the US, that's below minimum wage, right? So when you start doing the math on this, a lot of it doesn't make sense, right? Like trying to pick individual stocks and beat the market makes sense if you have like a, you know 10 million bucks. If you have 100,000, just it doesn't make, the time isn't worth it. So just think about that too. There's a lot of arguments here, but I think there's a lot of arguments against doing it because it, it doesn't make sense mathematically. It doesn't make sense, as I said, existentially or how you think about whether you know you're skilled. And then on performance, it doesn't make sense either. And do you think that limiting our portfolio into exclusively to um, uh, US stocks is a mistake because I know maybe the perspective for someone who's living in the United States is different because naturally such persons have the home bias. But even in Poland, even in Europe, I see people who are thinking about either having exclusively US stocks or maybe the, the broad basket, the world uh, um, basket of stocks. Uh, do you think that having just U.S. stocks is a mistake? We, by the way, see many statements f uh, coming from uh, different people like Warren Buffett or even uh, John Bogle was uh, very uh, um, towards investing exclusively in the U.S. stock market. How how you see that? So the arguments for investing only in U.S. stocks is, well, U.S. stocks are technically diversified because so much of their revenue comes from abroad. They, they're, you know, they operate abroad, so you kind of are getting world diversification in that way. Um, my counter is just that we've seen periods where U.S. stocks underperform, and so I think as this might sound a little crazy, but I think it makes more sense for a Polish investor to be all U.S. stocks than it is for a U.S. investor to be all U.S. stocks. And the reason I say that is just it's a hedge, right? Like. If you're living in the United States and you're all U.S. stocks and then the economy starts to turn, your stocks crash, you get fired from your job, like you're in a really rough spot. I'm not saying that that wouldn't be great for a Polish investor. I'm guessing there would be ramifications for Poland as well. But let's say you work somewhere in Poland that's kind of not it's like more recession resistant or it's like it doesn't matter what's going on with the global economy. You're doing something else in Poland where your stocks, you know, or I'm sorry, where the U.S. stock market is not necessarily going to affect your employment. Right. I'm just coming up with them. Let's say you're you work in government or something that's where the U.S. stock market doesn't impact how um, how you get paid or anything. In that case, like, OK, yes, the market's down and that sucks for your portfolio, but you still have a job. You're still doing your thing in the U.S. That person would kind of have double the exposure. Right. So I even think of myself, I. I think if, if I'm being truly honest, I should have way less, I should be taking way less financial risk, right? I should be, I work at a financial firm, which like the revenue that firm's linked to the stock market. So like I already am there. My portfolio is mostly equity. So that's now I'm doubling the lever on top of my job, right? And, you know, and it's my livelihood too. Like I talk about it. So it's like, there's so many things I'm like, so like my beta, you know, beta as they call it, if the market return beta is one, my beta is probably like three or something when you really like, not my actual beta, my portfolio, but when you take my lifestyle into account. But 
I think the whole thing is I can't be out there saying, hey, people just keep buying, buy stocks, and I don't own any stocks. I don't think that makes sense. I think it's a little hypocritical. And there are content creators that do that. There are people out there that are like talking about the powers of investing, yet all their money is invested in their own individual businesses. And I I think that's kind of like a weird, you know, kind of a little bit of, hypo, you know, um, being a little bit hypocritical when, when they do that. So that's why I say like, I'm, I'm not joking. I don't own a house. I don't own a car. I, I have like literally just clothes. I don't, I own barely any furniture. The only stuff I own, you can see back there in my books. Like that's it. Like I, my most 97% of my net worth is in financial securities. Like I don't just say, just keep buying. And then like secretly I have all these rental properties. I'm like, no, I mean, rental properties would be included in, in that, uh, but I'm just saying, like, I don't have anything like that. I don't have any physical real estate. I All my stuff's in financial securities because I believe in this stuff. I really do. And I don't tell people to, like, buy index funds and then I'm not buying them. Like, I am buying them. I own them. Like, this is my life. Like, you know, I, I've been renting apartments. I don't I don't own anything, like, physical. And I'm not saying I never will. I will probably buy a house at some point. But I, I'm, I'm looking at this and saying, like, hey, this is the philosophy. I don't just talk it. Like, you talk about skin in the game. I have my skin in the game. And, like, I work at a financial firm that where the revenue of that firm, which affects my compensation, um, is based on the stock market. So, like, my whole livelihood is tied to this thing. So I truly believe it and just want you to know. I mean, you brought up skin in the game earlier. So that's kind of – that's my take on it. Uh, could you please explain us why we shouldn't try to buy the dip? There's a whole part of your book dedicated to it. And I see quite often also uh, when I'm discussing to other people that although they are saying that they have the whole um, buy and hold portfolio, they are uh, calling themselves the passive investors, but they are, they are just uh, hunting, waiting for, for, for the dip. So even if they have some capital, the fresh capital, they could invest. They are just waiting for the... Uh, for some better occasion the problem with waiting to buy the dip is that strategy is only profitable when dips are large and they're very i mean so they have to be and those dips are rare that's the problem it's like they're only profitable with, with the largest dips and you have to time them pretty perfectly like if you're off the, the big dip by a little bit you it's not even as profitable so not only do you have to have like almost perfect market timing, but you have to have perfect market timing during a large dip. And that's where they actually make sense to do. But the problem is no one knows the future. No one knows when they're at the bottom. So because of that, most people that go to buy the dip, they're waiting and waiting and waiting. And by the time they do buy a dip, that dip is higher than where they could have bought originally. And the example I give in 2017, I actually wrote a blog post called Just Keep Buying, which basically eventually became the intro chapter to the book. And I remember people responding like, Nick, markets are so overvalued right now. Look at the CAPE ratio, this, that. And it's like, I'm waiting to buy the dip. Even if you had waited and you could perfectly time it and you waited until March 2020, which was obviously the stock market was crashing, and you waited till March 23rd in particular, which was like a Monday, the lowest the stock market got during that period, like the, the, the literal bottom of the dip was on that Monday. If you had saved your money and bought the dip on that day, you would have bought at prices about 7% higher than if you had just bought back in 2017. So it's one of these, like, even with it, I gave you perfect foresight to see the dip. I did. And so I do an I do a thought experiment in the book where I say, even God couldn't beat dollar cost averaging. The idea is yeah, someone who knew when the dips would be and they waited and they bought right at the bottom and they knew exactly when the bottom was that underperforms someone who just buys every month. And that's because, as I just said, large dips are rare. And so the only time they're profitable is when you can get them and they don't come that often. So even if you make money in this dip, take your victory lap, never do it again. If you ever make money in buying a dip, do not do it again because you're probably not going to get that opportunity again. And you think you could buy, and there's, what about, let's talk about the people who bought a dip and then it keeps dipping. Like, oh, it's down 20%. I bought the dip and now it's down 40%. Like the dip can keep dipping, right? And so that's another thing too, is like, I think there's a lot of people, especially after, you know, 2021 going into 2022, as the tech stuff started unwinding, oh, the, this stock's down 40%. I'm going to buy the dip. And it's like, well, now it's down 80%. Like, are you going to buy that dip too? It's like you, the dip can keep dipping, right? That's another piece of this that people don't realize. Like it's far better just to not think about it on time it and just keep buying something like a general market. I don't recommend this in individual stocks, obviously. It's very rare that a stock market goes down 80% and stays down. That has happened. And I know like we can talk about you know, Greece or Russia or whatever, there's a handful of, of markets where this has happened, but that's why we diversify. You never have all your money in one market and, and you and you would be okay. And what I really like about your book, and I will repeat myself, that you are giving specific proofs for that, what you're saying. So, because it, you know, it, it doesn't sound very intuitive quite often when we make such statements, but um, 
when you put the data on the table, then uh, it's better for people to understand. Um, and another statement, which may be not very intuitive, is that people are not thinking about investing being very dependent on luck. Um, but in fact, it is very dependent on luck. Could you please explain us why and how to mit mitigate that risk? So it's dependent on luck in the sense that the market will provide different returns over different time periods. And and the stat I love to use, it, and it's like the most cherry picking you can do, the most like I'm trying to make this as crazy as possible. If you would um, outperform the market by 5% a year, so you have 5% alpha is what it's called, from 1960 to 1980, and this is U.S. stock market, right? So if you outperform the U.S. stock market by 5% a year from 1960 to 1980, those 20 years, you would have made less money than if you had underperformed the market from 1980 to 19, or to, from 1980 to 2000 by 5%. So think about that. Someone who's really good, who actually beats the market by 5% a year from 1960 to 1980, makes less money. This is with dividends after inflation, right? makes less money than someone who underperforms the market from 1980 to 2000. So someone with actual verifiable skill, just because they were in this weird period, like made less money than someone who demonstrably has bad skill, has no skill, has anti-skill or whatever you want to call it, right? From 1980 to 2000. So that's a very extreme example, but that example shows that like from 1980 to 2000, like you just, it would, if you lost money in that period, like how, like, it's just the market went up so much that like, it's hard to see how someone would have lost. Remember 2000 was the tech bubble. A lot of, you know, the most overvalued the U S stock market ever was. So if you look at that and it's like, wow, that is just quite a period. And there's really been nothing like it in U S market history. So to see that and be like, wow, that's kind of crazy. But that goes to show like luck matters. It's going to matter. And so how do you mitigate it? Like, there's always things you can do to offset. And so what does that mean? What assets you choose to own? Like what you can do in your personal life to offset luck. Like if you go through a bad period, let's say I, well, let's say we're investing, let's say the next 20 years, like US equity returns are flat after inflation, right? So you just, you just match inflation, right? So that's not great, but it's still like, it's better than anything else. Like, do you think, you know, if, if US equity returns are flat after inflation, do you think US bonds are going to be providing this great return? Probably not. They're probably much worse. They're probably down quite a bit after inflation. Um, so it's like, it's not great when, when something doesn't return above inflation, but just the fact that you can get an inflation adjusted like return is still something, right? So if that's the case, then you have to just come up with other, like own other assets. You have to think about what you can do in your personal life to offset. So there are ways to mitigate luck. They're not easy things, but there's like a lot of little things. You, there's, you always have a choice, right? No matter what, there's always options and to remember that during difficult periods. And what do you think about adding, for example, um, managed futures to a uh, portfolio? Now it's quite easy to get access to it uh, through ETFs. I know this is a very um, unknown uh, asset class, especially among individual investors. But um, I personally, I'm, I'm pretty big fan of adding at least small portion uh, of such asset class to, to portfolio just for diversification. What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I have nothing against it. Uh, the, the nice thing about managed futures is that they are or they do have a low correlation with traditional asset classes, which is nice. The bad thing or, you know, it's like it's difficult for people to understand. And so I, I think most retail investors, it doesn't necessarily make sense. I mean, especially if they don't understand exactly what's going on. But two, the fees can be a bit higher than compared to like obviously an index fund. So that's the only thing. It's like, okay, as long as you're kind of getting what you want out of it, if you want that diversification. But for a lot of people, like, I, I don't, at, at the end of the day, like, how much of your portfolio is in it, right? If you put 1% into managed futures, that's not going to really make a difference. I mean, you know, if you put 5%, maybe 10, that could make a little bit of a difference and kind of help with kind of the, the volatility of your portfolio. I'm not necessarily for or against. I'm kind of just open about it. Um, it's whatever you want. It's you know. That's I'm not, there's no asset class I'm completely against. Generally, like I'm, I'm I don't really love commodities. I think commodities are ones that generally have a negative return, and once in a while they do really well. And so it's once again what, when we start breaking down everything comes back into there's some form of market timing or stock selection, right? It, it, that's why I look at or I call security selection, right? Like. So what are you doing? What is managed futures? Is that a market timing strategy? I would say not necessarily. I would say it's probably more of a security selection type strategy. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's interesting, but um, I, it, 
it's tough tough question to answer i don't know how to i think it's fine for some people if they want to do it i don't personally recommend it i have nothing against those who use it I fully agree with you that for the average investor, it may be not so easy to understand. And this is enough to not invest in things which they don't understand. Um, in your book, you put a very wonderful, and this is my best uh, statement from your book, uh, and let me just quote it. Though you can always earn more money, nothing can buy you more time. And really, I, I love this, this sentence uh because it's so wise and it's so deep uh could you please explain us uh here what's behind what's your uh what you wanted to express here uh, with this statement um time is your most important asset it's not even close um and when you think about like what you can do with your time compared to what you can do with money at some point you're going to be older and you're not going to have as much time and you know and I, the thought experiment i give is you know imagine Warren Buffett today, you know, would you would you trade places with Warren Buffett? You could have his wealth, his connections, everything, but you'd have to be his age, right? I think he's like eighty eight and ninety almost now at this point. It's like most people would not do that trade. I would say I would say almost no one would make that trade because they know, like, hey, I'd rather just live my life as a more typical average person than be like one of the richest people on earth. I don't think it's worth it because you know you wouldn't have enough time. You would feel you know his age and all that. So. I think people understand this very like intuitively. It's like very obvious that like, okay, money and time can't be perfectly traded. They can for like periods of your life. Like, hey, obviously you work a job for money. You're trading your time for money. Like that makes sense. But at some point it's gonna, it, it won't make as much sense. And so thinking about those things and how you make decisions are incredibly important, especially earlier in life because those early decisions can impact you in, in big ways later in life. Okay, uh, we are reaching to the end. Uh, so let me ask you the last question. What are, in your opinion, the biggest lies or uh, misconceptions about investing? Um, because, you know, there's so many opinions out there, but uh, not all of them are, you know, uh, true. So what's your take on this, uh, this topic? I mean, I, I've been, a, 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 I would say, not a fan, an anti-fan of market timing. I think market timing is one of the biggest lies out there and of course people have done it and people will continue to do it but they won't do it consistently i don't know anyone that's timed the market multiple times over their career and gotten it right every single time there are a few instances where i know people have been like hey this looks like a bubble and they were right but they maybe they called it like three years early so they, even then like they were right but they their timing wasn't exact so that's the one thing I want to say. Most people that get it right, like they don't, they don't hit a grand slam twice. It's very rare that's that's people do. And I think the example I like to look at is like Michael Burry, who's on Twitter, and he's like very famous for his like Twitter account, whatever his Cassandra account, and he'll say he'll put out these predictions all the time, like oh market's gonna crash more, and he and he's been wrong for so long. He he hit 2000, 2008 right. He hit the nail on the head, perfect. And so everyone thinks he's like this, you know genius at market timing and since then he's missed it every single time and so i just think that if if he who's obviously very intelligent i'm not down downgrading his intelligence or his skill or anything i think it's just incredibly hard and this is not there's nothing there's not a knock against michael burry i'm a big fan of michael burry but at the same time like making predictions about the future is is very difficult and it's not something that that i recommend anyone try to do so that's the biggest the biggest lie or biggest myth in personal, uh, I'm sorry, in investing is just not to, don't market time, please. Yeah, the thing is that um, investing should be boring, but you know, it, that's why we call that it's the art of doing nothing because it's not that easy because we are inclined to do something. And this is so unnatural for us probably. Uh, Nick, thank you very much for your time. I very appreciate, uh, very, uh, very nice discussion. Is there anything else you would like to add before we will uh, quit today? Oh, no, that's it. Uh, if you guys want to reach out to me, um, I'm on Twitter at dollars and data or on Instagram at Nick Majuli. Feel free to DM me. I return every DM. And even if you send me something in Polish, I have chat GPT. I can translate whatever. So that's it's right. easy now. So thank you. I will put all the links in the show notes for, for this uh, interview. Nick, thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Appreciate your thank time. Thank you. Bye bye.